Okay, bom dia. Guten Morgen, as I say in Germany. Don't be worried, you know, I won't continue to speak German. See if we get an image here. So, thanks very much for, for being here. Thanks for Jura and NBS and everybody there to actually invite me to come here. So, Jura and me met in Amsterdam at a, at a conference called Picnic. And we connected afterwards on Twitter. And uh, Juras, uh, the reason that I'm here and actually speaking to you today is very interesting, is both the real life meeting and the internet connection that we made, right? It, it teaches a lesson that we need both. I will need to meet in person and we need to connect on the web. So it's not either or, right? I think that I have met many people on Twitter and SlideShare and YouTube. It's a very powerful thing that's happening. Um, I was also invited to speak yesterday at the Fundación Dom Cabral, so I also want to thank them for helping to bring me over here. And this was a very good session yesterday we had with the CEOs. Here's my Twitter handle, uh, G. Leonhardt. Uh, if you want to uh, connect, feel free. Uh, we're going to make this a presentation available at mediafuturist.com for downloading the, the whole thing. So it's about 100 pages. You can download uh, sometime tonight when I get back from the bar with Jura. So, um, I was born in Germany, but I moved to America to be a, a jazz musician when I was 22. So, if I speak too quickly in English, just wave or tell me to slow down, okay? Um, and I, I've picked up a bad habit from America. So, what does a futurist do? Well, it's really a simple story. I look at basically ideas. Uh, ideas that I see, I work in Asia, I work in Europe, I live in Switzerland. Uh, I look at ideas and I try to make a connection for my clients. So that's what I do. I, I try to collect ideas. Uh, and I have clients in the telecom, media, entertainment, communication space. Here's a couple examples. From the BBC to Google to Nokia to agencies to ITV and so on and so on. Um, I work with a team of people around the world who are also futurists. Um, I'm not a futurist like Ray Kurzweil. Uh, I don't think of 50 years from now. I don't believe in the human machine substitute. Um, I look at the next two or three, five years. So for me, this is the present. So the story I'm about to tell you is very much about the present. Because one thing that we have to think about is we have to find a way to have foresight in our planning. Because many of us, of course, are running businesses, so you're always busy chasing tomorrow. You know, chasing the immediate thing, right? It's nice to have some foresight. I have an iPhone application. If you have an iPhone, uh, just search for uh, Media Futurist as a free application. Will also be out on Android next week. So futurism, I, I, I took some inspiration from um, the chief of Google, Eric Schmidt. Uh, I watch a lot of videos on the web from interesting people. And this is what Eric is saying about the future. My view is that, that you, you asked the question, if I may, in sort of the wrong yeah. order. The right way to answer the question is, what does the future look like? And then how does everybody's models adapt to that? Yeah. That gives you the question of the day. What does the future look like it? And how do we adapt to it? The future in Brazil is obviously different than the future in Switzerland or in Indonesia. Right? So I cannot talk a whole lot about Brazil. And I apologize because I don't know much about Brazil. It's my second visit. Uh, I hope to learn more about it in the future. Is the microphone OK? OK, good. So um, the record industry, the music industry, is famous for doing the other way around. right? see what the future looks like it and try to prevent it. Right. So the success of the music industry show speaks for itself. Right? The industry has been reduced by 50%. 30 billion to 14 billion, if you're lucky. So we wait another five years, it'll be minus five. We have, to, we have to pay for them to live. So what does the future hold? How do we prepare for it? That is the key question of the conversation today. Uh, there's a great saying, if Henry Ford went to the people and he asked what they wanted, they would have said they want faster horses. Instead, he made the car. Okay. So we cannot always go and talk to people and say, what do you want now? We have to go a little beyond the obvious. Right? We have to use our own imagination. We have to have some foresight. Especially now in Brazil, because you're right on the verge of broadband, mobile, you have a lot of young people, right? It's exploding. You need some foresight. If you only think about tomorrow, not the day after tomorrow, you won't have enough foresight. Around the world, this is what Eric Schmidt said at the Barcelona 
World Congress on mobile, he said, from now on, Google is all about mobile first. Mobile first. This is a very big step for Google, and of course, it's happening as a response to Twitter and, and to Apple as well. But mobile first, that should be the way that we think about communications. The computer is the past. Right? In developed countries, the computer is everywhere. It's being replaced by the mobile phone, by mobile access. Right? Look at the numbers here for a mobile usage. This is an old number from 2007. Right? It says 44 million people in Brazil will be using mobile internet in 2012. And this is an old number. Right? Let's make it 100 million. If 100 million people in Brazil are using the mobile internet at low cost with cheap devices, it changes everything that you do. It changes how you sell, it changes how you do politics, it changes how you get media, it changes everything, and not all to the good, of course. All right, that's another discussion. But uh, the chief of Google, of course, has no, you know, making that shift in this direction is quite obvious for them. It's all about this. Not this phone, but it's all about this. Mobile, social, networked, real-time, in control. That means the customer, not you, is in control. Let's not get confused about this, right? When people get connected, they get control. It's as simple as that. Growth of mobile phone, 10% of mobile phone penetration gives 1% growth in, in domestic product, in GDP. So the economy of countries is directly related to broadband and to mobile. The more connected, the more growth. The more development, right, the more income in any country around the world. Every single government around the world, the number one objective is to connect people. To connect people so that they can sell, they can communicate, they can learn. Right? So what we're going to see here is that these things will become the number one operating paradigms of communications. And real time means when you search Google, you don't want to know what I said a year ago. You want to know what I said five minutes ago. You want to see the latest thing on the brand, you want to see the latest offers and so on. So real time is a very, very big thing. So this actually again is an old number. It's 1% now growth of GDP for 10% growth in mobile. And of course, the Brazilian government has just now, Jura told me on the way over here, said that their broadband is a top priority. In Finland, you can sue the government if you don't have internet access. Right? In Finland is a guaranteed right. The right of free speech includes the right of internet. Right? In France, of course, they want to disconnect us, <laughs> right? because we're doing something that they're not supposed to do. Right? Kind of interesting, but of course in France everything is possible. So, what we have now is kind of scary, right? We're sitting here and we're looking, you know, if you're my age, you're looking at this stuff and you say, I don't understand. It's like, what is this? This is crazy. This is madness, right? Why are people uploading 65 million photos to Flickr every single day? Who has the time? People uploading 14 hours of video every minute on YouTube. Who's wasting all their time on this? Why? 8.6 billion minutes spent on Facebook every single day. 8.6 billion minutes. Wow, just everybody's become a huge time waster, right? So you're, you're wondering about this. Why is this happening, right? This is very scary, I think, for a lot of brands. What we have here is an unprecedented change in communications and in commerce. Uh, keep in mind, when we talk about social media, that word is useless, right? Really what we're seeing here is social business. It's a change in the operating system of business, not just in media. Uh, it's a change from being asocial, like television, right, to doing things differently because we're connected. It has nothing to do with Twitter or Facebook, right? So if you think that you can fix the problem by having a Facebook account, then you're looking in the wrong direction. Right? It's a lot deeper than that. So back in the, a little while ago, I used to be a student of theology, I have to admit. you know. Uh, so I know what happened here. When Gutenberg invented the printing press, was the same big change. All of a sudden, people could read the Bible in different places, and they could be translated into German, which was unheard of. right? 
And you did not have to go to church to listen to the Bible. You could read yourself if you could read, right? The church hated this. The church said you can't print the Bible. It's not, you're supposed to have it in Latin and spoken or handwritten because only we can do it. So Gutenberg made a deal with the church, right? And the church became more powerful as a consequence of the printing. That is exactly what's going to happen in media. None of the media companies like the internet, really. Because it, it disrupts the, the scan, right? It disrupts the idea. It disrupts the idea that they are the broadcaster, you know, the monologue. Right? Now they have to have a conversation. But every single media company is now making deals with the internet. Right? We will see all the stuff that we've seen, the dangers merged over into just becoming part of the solution. And where is this going to happen first? You have to answer the question, it is not going to happen in America. It's not going to happen in Germany, Switzerland, Europe. It's going to happen in the so-called developing countries. Brazil, Russia, India, China. It will happen here first before it happens in America. The problem of downloading music or getting everything for free, in parentheses, will be fixed here first. It will not be fixed in America, right? Because the business is stagnated. It's not moving. So I think you have a great chance here to exploit the explosive market, people connecting to the internet. We're going to take questions, by the way, afterwards, so we'll just kind of save them or Twitter them if you want. Not that I have time to look at it. But here is the change. If you're in the marketing business, right, expect 30% of all advertising to shift to digital, interactive, mobile, social, and video in the next two to three years. We've had a recession, and of course, things were delayed, everybody pulling back, right? Now we're going back into the flow of things. Every single brand is saying, why are we doing big ads in Rolling Stone magazine? Can we do an iPhone app? Right? Can we make a video channel? You know, when I saw the trailer from NBS in the beginning, I can just feel the creativity is sparking. Right? That is what you need. You need to move in this direction because that's the future. Television, newspapers, radio will not go away. Mass media will not go away. That's clear. Television is just as important, but it will converge with the internet. Television and the internet will converge 100%, meaning all of the shows will be catch-up TV. You can watch it any time, any location, any device, any platform, right? It will converge. So your job, if you're in the marketing business, is how to combine the mass medium with the niche medium with the internet. That is the mission. Looking at this projection I got a couple days ago from Screen Digest, right? the growth of content on the mobile. Right? This is mobile music, mobile games, mobile TV, video, and the app store. <coughs> the average person that has an iPhone spends $10.90 a month on buying applications for the iPhone. $10 a month on buying stuff that's otherwise free. That shows you people are buying stuff when they see value and when the package looks good. Right? The money is there. Anybody that tells you that people aren't buying content on the, on the internet is not true. We just haven't found the right package. And that's what we can see with the iPhone and the Android world is that this kind of growth is going to be phenomenal. Every doctor will have an iPhone app. Every hospital will have iPhone apps or phone apps, not just the iPhone. In fact, I think the iPhone is the smaller part of the equation. All right. But all of that will happen in the next couple of years. So this kind of advertising, I didn't pick this by purpose, I know Coke is a client, but this kind of advertising is noise. On the internet and on the mobile, we don't want noise. That's why advertising on the internet today is pretty much useless. CPMs, making noise, banners, interruptions. We just tune out. Right? What we need on the internet today, what we need in the future for advertising is this, is attraction. This is an application for the BMW that you can download and play for free. That's also an ad, right? But it's also a game. It makes sense. It's relevant, it's entertaining. So we're moving from noise, this is true noise, Bangkok, Thailand. 
I shot this myself. This is a huge screen in Bangkok broadcasting to everyone, right? Commercials all day long, right? And imagine the noise, you know, this is like obviously nobody's listening, right? I mean, how expensive is this? Right? And it's useless. That is not our future. Our future is attraction. Our future is going in this direction. The iPad. So? Let me show it to you now. This is what it looks like. I happen to have one. He happens to have one. Well, I'm, as I said earlier, it's not Apple that I'm talking about here. I'm talking about the possibility of reformatting media and content, right? On an iPad, on a phone, on a tablet, and those tablets will be $10 from a Chinese manufacturer, right? You can do all kinds of creative things with ads that people perceive as content, right? This is a whole different world. Look at this projection of business and consumer mobile applications, spending on applications $7 billion in 2012 spent on business applications for the mobile. Again, every university will have an, an application where you can learn when you're in the car or on the bus. Right? Every single brand will have a way of connecting with them through mobile applications. This is a huge opportunity. Also looking at these stats from, from a recent Luda Finn study, is saying that mobile phones are the strongest social connector in the world. And I'm talking about uh, internet-connected mobile phones, right? Messaging, emails, and so on and so on. But uh, studies have shown in America that 74% of Americans would never give their mobile phone to somebody else. Not for five minutes. The most powerful device in the world is now becoming available for you to market and to find people, to connect with people. Right? So this is a very big trend. Now we have book publishers saying, oh, this is pretty cool because we can sell electronic books on the mobile platform, right? Of course, there's a big problem here, right? If we're thinking that we're going to get the same money then for the real book and put copy protection on it and force us into all kinds of schemes, it will go the same direction than the music industry. So what needs to happen here is we have to find standards. Google is the master of this. This is basically the idea of saying the rising tide floats all boats. The rising tide floats all boats. When the internet connects people and we are connected on the mobile phone, everyone that goes with it rides along with it. But you have to be in the boat. Right? If you stand on the island, you wait for the boat to go by, you're not part of the tide. Right? You have to actually be on the boat. And it, of course we're saying like Facebook or YouTube, none of that is making any money. Right? So if you point to Facebook and say, well, Facebook is break even, that's great. YouTube loses money. And it certainly isn't paying the artists for the videos. But it will happen. It's just delayed, but it will happen. It took uh, Google two years to stumble across the business model for Google, which is those tiny boxes that you see on the browser, right? making $2.6 billion a month now. And Google is gearing up to make $25 billion a month in mobile video search, real-time advertising. Right? That is the rising tide that's also going to float you. But look at the projections here by PricewaterhouseCoopers. The projections of growth in video games, right, 11.8%, and they are followed, uh, preceded by about 16%. Uh, Television is going to increase again, too. That's the interesting part. Because television is the internet now, right? so it's basically sort of overlapping, right? And internet, wired and mobile. Look at the growth here, right? Look at the bad part of it. Newspapers, right? Declining 11%. Radio declining. Directories, trade magazines, right? But interestingly, you know, the, the overall growth is much bigger, pretty much across the board, except for maybe newspapers. So what's now happening is that every newspaper is becoming a video channel. Every newspaper is becoming an audio podcaster. Every media company is going into parallel media. A television station has blogs, they have podcasts, so of course they make videos and so on, but it's all called cross-media. Bill Gates has said years ago, and he's a very smart guy, we, we overestimate the change that will occur now 
and we underestimate the change that will occur later in the next 10 years. I'm telling you now, we have already had now 10 years ago, and we thought it was going to happen then, you know, in the, in the first part of the internet. Right? But the change that's coming now will be much bigger than anything we've ever thought of. It's just taken longer. Right? So it's, uh, basically the internet is not an organic development like this. It's a, it's a hockey stick. Right? It reaches a point of takeoff and it just takes off. Right? So keep that in mind when you're planning. Right? It's like an on-off switch. Back to what I said earlier about the future. So if this is our mantra, right? This is the music industry. Great success, America, music industry. 14.6 dropping to 6.3, dropping towards zero. Okay. Because their paradigm, again, is the idea of saying, how can we prevent the future? Edgar Bronfman, the head of Warner Music, last week or two weeks ago at the earnings call where they presented the, the numbers of the company, right? He said, basically, that free streaming of music is not positive for the industry and clearly, we won't do it. Okay? What does that tell you? It's like, is he running the universe? Like, people are going to do free streaming, and they already do. You're not going to license it? Well, that's great. But I mean, which way this is going to go, right? You're going to say, I don't like this, but who cares? <laughs> do you make any money? The question for artists, writers, composers, authors is not whether you can stick to some sort of principle from 50 years ago. The question is whether you can get compensated for your work. Right? As Larry Lessig, Creative Commons, has said, compensation, not control. That, that's the goal, right? You want to get paid for your work. So it's not about those principles that somebody in some boardroom thinks up, right? It's not about that. I call these toxic assumptions. Right, in your mind that poison you. Think about maybe some of those are in our minds as well. Right? One assumption is we can, we can enforce a different future than that which our customers want. Right? Wow, that is the music industry in its purest form. Right? If the book publishers go in this direction too, that would be terrible. I'm, I, I publish books. Right? I would much rather have a person pay one dollar for my ebook and get a good piece of that than charge twenty dollars for a printed book where the truck driver makes more money than I do. And that's the truth, right? The printers, the truck drivers, the ink makers make more money than the author. Right? Is that the problem? The author has to get paid, right? Not the truck driver. They have to get paid otherwise. The other thing is, you know, the toxic assumption, we can ignore the user's needs and behaviors and just mold them. Uh, we just make them do something different. Right. 2.1 billion people connected to the internet, 4.2 billion on mobile phones. Right. We're going to tell those people that they can't listen to a stream of music because Edgar Bronfman doesn't like it. Right. It's not going to happen. The paradigm of saying we need to watch out for what's good for us because we need to make money. Of course that's true. Everybody has to do that. But if all you're concerned with is your own revenues, you are in deep trouble now. Right? Because now everything is connected. We're living in a world of an ecosystem. If you're a telecom company, you have to think about what's good for the authors and the content owners. If you're in marketing, you have to think of how you invent products that are a win-win situation. Right? You have to think about something that fits. So, the last point is the, is the worst one, right? More control, more money. I mean, this is business school, right? It's quite simple. I didn't go to business school, obviously, but if you go to business school 10 years ago, it's quite simple. You control distribution, you control production, you control marketing, you control everything, you make money. That's it, and you make more money tomorrow. That doesn't work anymore now because of the internet. Because when you try to control what users are doing, they disconnect from you. You have to actually give the control to the user. That's what's happening in branding, and marketing, and media, and technology. Give control to the user. So we have a big challenge. We have an open internet where we have closed minds, many of us, 
Like, okay, we can go in on the internet at fast speed, but our mind is the speed of a snail. Because we're old, that's the other problem, of course, right? We use email. So here's a great quote from one of the oldest guys who's otherwise quite uh, uh, interesting. He, uh, he bought MySpace, so Rupert Murdoch. And he says, this is a quote, you have to believe this. I mean, of course, he's 84, he's an extremely brilliant guy. But he said this last week about books. He said, we don't like $9.99 as the price for an ebook, which is the Amazon Kindle, right? We think it really devalues books and hurts the retailers. That's just a very good fit with Bronfman now, isn't it? Like, I don't like $9.99, I think it's too expensive. Okay, I think I'm with you on this one. Right? Would you rather sell 2% of the population a book for $9.99 an ebook, or would you rather sell it for $1.99 to 90% of the population? I mean, is that so hard to understand, the logic? Not really. So I think those are issues we're going to have to look at, right? We have this traditional debate in the content industries, you know, because I work a lot with people who are producing content, and they think of the world like this. They think of content as king. And of course, I agree to a large degree that is the case, obviously, because that's how it all gets started. Unfortunately, the world is on black and white. Right? So you can't say content is king, you have to pay before anything happens. Now it's the context that is king. Also, right? who is recommending it? Who has rated it? Who has shared it? Right? What do my friends say about this? Right? That is happening, and of course, relevance. Do I get the right content at the right time? So if I'm traveling in Sao Paulo, do I want to know about great restaurants in Hong Kong? No, I want about, about great restaurants here. Right? That is relevance and that is convenience. And this is the great hope for the mobile phone. All of these things are happening on the mobile phone. So what you can sell there becomes not just the content, but the whole package. When you sell music, you don't sell the zeros and ones. You sell the rating, the playlist, the curation, the other media, the access, the membership, the fan situation. You sell everything around the music. That's what we're going to see. And for branding, it's the same thing, right? This is the very simple problem in a nutshell, in our minds, right? I should be talking because, you know, I like control, just like everyone else likes control. Controlling your destiny, your security, and all these things. So in the old days, this is the paradigm, right? More control, more money. And if you're not 15, then you know what I'm talking about. You know, right? Because that's how it worked. And we felt very safe with this model. So if you're a brand, you would not go to your, to your clients and you would say, you can get my stuff for free. In return, you put up videos about my stuff and you can say whatever you want. That's a crazy idea. That's exactly what Ford did last year in the Ford Fiesta movement, it's called, right? Giving away free cars in return for making videos about the car. And you could say anything you want. Right? So what's happening now is that we have to de-emphasize the control. That is our only way to move forward, right? It's not a question of principle. It's a question of moving the money into one direction and finding multiple new sources for new money. It's not that we don't, we're going to forget about having control. Of course, we want that. It's not an absolute question. We need to, however, figure out if we keep on saying that we want control, do we just forget about the money? Right? If you're in television or if you're in films or publishing, if you like control more than money, you won't be here in three years. If you are a brand and you want to control the message, you want to control it, you won't be here in five years because the user wants a piece of that control now. And that's, and that's what's happening pretty much across the world. So in a black and wild world, black and white world, we have a yes or no on the control, right? So you can say, okay, I give up all control, then you Skype, right? Or maybe Google to some degree, right? You're somewhere in the middle, right? Or you really like control, you keep on moving the button around, right? This is a strategy, it's not about yes or no. It's about the right amount at the right time. 
the most successful brand that is utterly controlled and dominated by one brilliant guy, Apple. I love Apple stuff. But this really pisses me off. I still use it, right, because I've decided to play along. Right? Apple is the most successful company in the entire period of the recession for the last two years. People buy expensive stuff regardless of what happens. And they control everything. So you can say, okay, it works. It works. It can work. But it's the exception. I would not recommend you try this. First of all, nobody is like Steve Jobs. That's one thing. The other thing is, it's very expensive, and it has one chance of surviving. It's a very insular thing. So what we're seeing here is that the answer to control is to say, it depends. It depends when you can be open, when you can be controlled. Think of Google. Who thinks of Google as a company that is controlling? Anyone here? Yeah, you can, you can be frank, right? Yes, okay. So there are those voices and that's good, right? But by and large, people think of a company that's not like Apple because they give us everything for free, right? Google is making free what has made money before. Email, operating system, mobile documents, calendar, pretty soon a box like this, right? So Google is perceived by many people as not being so much about control, right? But Google, of course, does not publish the source code for the search engine, right? Google has a lot of control over our data. So Google has found a pretty good compromise, I think, in the open and control paradigm. So when you run a brand, this is what you have to do. You have to say, at what point can I afford to open up and give something that the user feels like I'm giving something? And at what point should you find a way to retain a bit of control? Right? This is a very, very difficult proposition. So the Fiesta movement is a great example, right? Ford gave 100 cars away. You could apply by making a video. This was, I think, two years ago in the US, right? And you would be published as a user, right? And you can publish any video you want about the Fiesta. It was no censorship. You could say it completely sucks, a terrible car. Right? You just publish it. Result was 14% more sales right? of this exercise. Right, because it has to do with trusting the consumer. It is all around us, even now in this very room. Yes, this, this thing is all around us, right? This shift from control to open, that's happening across the board. And it can be a rather painful exercise, right? Basically, today, control does not equal money anymore. That is something we have to subscribe to. What choices do we have? Right. We can keep on saying the law allows me to have control over you, the user, whether you download the picture or the software or whatever it is, right? That's all true, but does it make money? Right. Do I get compensated? We're switching from what I call an ego system to an ecosystem. You have to look no further than America. Right. America was all about domination, control, power. Now America is starting to say, ah, oh, this is not really working out so well with the ego system. Maybe we can collaborate. Right? America now wants to collaborate. They've never learned how to collaborate. Right? America wasn't about collaborating. Right? Now that's shifting to an ecosystem. The future is good for companies that know how to build an ecosystem to make money for the other people around themselves and for themselves. Right? And you can say about Google what you want. But Google is trying to make this work. Right? Google is trying to create ecosystems for everyone. And it's not an easy position to be in, given the history. So iTunes, Apple, right? this is what they do. And we happily chained to iTunes and we keep buying. That's, again, is an exception. But it's also sort of interesting to see in this world, closed versus open, right? The iPad. Google tablet, the App Store, and Android, right? It's not a question of what will win, but basically what happens initially, of course, we are happy with the App Store with 220,000 apps from divorce apps to whatever, right? Now we're switching to an open ecosystem. I think Google and Android, of course, have 
chances of really growing into an open system. Both will coexist. But do ask yourself the question, if you're in branding or marketing, can you afford to be closed? Spend the money on this kind of branding? Be as brilliant as Steve Jobs is? Can you, do, can you really do this? What are the chances that you can do an Apple? They're very slim. So I wouldn't bank on that. Here's some recent developments I want to share with you just to sort of get the juice flowing. This is an application by Sports Illustrated, which is, uh, you know, the bath suits and stuff. Yeah. I haven't been in it, I'm just saying. But so they have a new thing that they do on tablet computers. And I'll show you what it looks like so you can, you can sort of get in a feel. I'm the editor of Sports Illustrated, and here's your new issue. We hope you like the cover. Let's get a look inside. Okay, here are the latest scores and news stories. Would you call this a magazine? It's television, right? It's television. Or is it a magazine? Or is it a newspaper? I don't know. Who cares? Right? Basically, magazines are becoming cross-media. Right? Audio, video, text, social networks, connecting, tweeting, all in this thing. And are we going to pay for this? I think many of us would probably consider it or maybe bundle it into something. Right? And this is still a difficult question. So the user interface make, interfaces make all the difference. And if you think about this for a second, the computer clearly is a work tool. Right? The iPhone or the Android phone is a sort of kind of work, right? but we like to play with it. So now, again, when you, when you go to a bar and you meet another guy, you don't talk about cars anymore. You talk about your iPhone apps. Right? You say, which apps do you have? Right? This is kind of work, but not really. The iPad and the tablet is definitely not work. Right? It's touching, it's immersive, it's reading books, it's entertainment. Right? There's great hope here for publishers. If they keep the price right and get rid of the copy protection, this could be a very, very interesting thing in the future. These devices will be given away for free by companies in the hope of you subscribing to their content. They will be given away from the likes of Nokia, Samsung, and LG for free if you do your banking to the device and they get a piece of your transaction. Every single African will have one of these boxes presented by somebody because they don't have banks, real banks. Right? They have to use this. They will also measure your blood pressure and whatever it is, if you so want, and transmit it to your doctor. So you can look at the latest chat about your health problems. Right? This is the future that we're going, this is a vast opportunity and I think if you're in the business of advertising, you have to make sure the advertisers are going to come along for this soon. This is very important to fuel it, right? If you look at what we have on the computer, it's a, I call it a flighty situation. When you work on the computer, there's a thousand things you can do click on the email, do an SMS, you're constantly distracted, right? Because it's work. A book is not distractive. When you're lying in bed, you're immersed in reading Paolo Coelho's book, whoever book, right? It happens to be my favorite author. But you're immersed, right? You're not disturbed by emails when you read a book. At least most people aren't. On the tablet, I call this Immersion 2.0. This is you can touch the interface and pretty soon you can project from it. Right? You have media, it's a story. Right? There's huge potential in this sort of scenario, right? especially for books. Think about this for a minute. Every student around the world has to buy books for, for learning. Africans don't have books. They can't afford to ship the books from Europe to read about the Harvard Business Review study. If this book is available as a subscribed service, as a bundled service into the mobile phone, right? how much would it cost, how much money would it make, how much money would it save for governments to put the entire education textbooks on mobile devices? That is our future. Right? That is the future of reading stuff that's about education. It's the future of Wikipedia in a way, right? completely interactive, overlapping with existing information. 
This is the iPad showing the New York magazine, New Yorker magazine, uh, in a store somewhere that somebody filmed when it came out. Now, if you're in the advertising business, right, you have to think about this. This is advertising for the lean back consumption. Somebody on a couch doing content advertising becomes content. If you imagine over the screen to have a big banner saying buy, buy diapers now, that's not going to work. This device will know who you are, where you are, if you allow it, what your preferences are, what you have opted in, right? all the information that sounds very scary, of course, on one end. But on the other end, it will provide stuff to you for free as a result of what you're doing there, right? providing the data. Right? This is not an easy issue, but it's something that we're seeing. I think we expect a lot more of this superimposed reality over the mobile phone. A thing called Wikitude. The Wikitude web browser can be used to examine our environment, to find what we as humans use in our immediate surroundings for clues, data, and information that help us make decisions. Wikitude, the augmented reality browser. So what this does is you hold up the mobile phone and you see information superimposed over the screen. Right? Any building, any landmark or so, right, is integrated into the screen. This will become a standard. And even scarier, when I'm on a date, I can hold up the screen, identify you, go to your Facebook profile, and <coughs> as we're dating, and I can decide not to pursue the date. But anyway, imagine what this could do for personalized, engaged, conversational marketing. If we allow it, and here is why we're going to allow it. We're going to allow it because the benefit of what we're going to get back in return will be so huge that we will take a limited approach to saying we'll share some of our data, including location-based data. In an Asia, of course, already widely used. Right? We have concerns about this, but this is something I think that we can solve. Of course, there's lots of issues here. With books, right? We're approaching the Napster moment. Anybody here remember Napster from 10 years ago, music? Right? Of course, it was big in Brazil, right? 75 million downloads in six months. Okay. Now what's happening with books is this. Two lights, two cameras, and where the action happens, which is an acrylic platen and a book holder covered in toolbox liner. To use it, you simply load in a book, like so, center it on the cameras, and press this button. With each press of the button, I capture two pages. Captures two pages. There's 100,000 people or so doing this now with every single book, capturing books, so that make those downloads available for free. Right? Free is going to happen to books. Right? How can we make money with books when the copy is free? Right? Well, the answer is, of course, to an author, he never made any money anyway. Right? <laughs> I mean, to most authors. Right? This is a concern, of course, for popular authors. Right? Right, so again, as I was saying earlier, most of the money of a book is not made by the author. Right? So if you can find a digital way to deliver this that gets you paid, everything should be fine. Right? This is the way forward that we're going to see for, for what I like to call content 2.0. The future of content is compensation, not control. This is very hard if you're in the middle. If you're a publisher, a media company, a rights holder, you don't really like this idea, right? because you're selling the copy. So it's a tough place. Many of my clients are on this turf, and we are trying to figure out business models, how to connect the artists and the writers. This is a machine that does three-dimensional printing. Anybody has seen something like this? OK, 3D printing allows to print any object. And the plastic mold, now that, that device used to cost 100,000 euros, now I think it's 2,000. You download a design, a cat design from the internet for a cup or a shoe, or a robot, you know, I don't know, something, and you can print it. You can print physical objects. These devices are going to get so good that you can print a Nike shoe. All, right. All you have to do is share the design, feed the information to the machine. So if you're thinking that stealing, in parentheses, of content is restricted, to digital stuff, you're on the wrong trail, right? This is going to happen to a lot of things, right? And now there's replicators that can make replicators. 
Right? There's 3D printers that print 3D printers. So the entire industry, the, the chief of Sony said last year at CES, Sony does not sell stuff. Sony sells services and experiences. Entire industries are shifting over to sell, yes, you know, we sell cars, but really we don't sell the car because pretty much every car is almost the same now, right? We sell the service, the experience, the brand, the feeling, the soft stuff is what you sell, right? Why do you buy something? You don't buy it just because it's good stuff, right? Because of the experience. So talk about experience, right? Many of us are on Facebook. Now there's a new thing happening on Facebook called social games. Anybody know about Farmville? If you have kids, you may know about this, right? Virtual business, last year virtual items were worth $6.2 billion. People buying virtual flowers for each other, right? Just to show this example, this is not a friend of mine, I'm just showing an example. There is this amazing Facebook application called Farmville. Some of you may or may not heard of it, and it is so addictive and I've fallen in love. So basically what you do is you create your own farm and you get money and coins and all types of things and you can buy like um, strawberries and you can plant seeds. You can buy strawberries and plant seeds. Now here's the interesting part about Farmville, right? It's only on Facebook. People buy 800,000 tractors. Tractors, you know, on Farmville with real money. Right? They make $200 million last year. Right? So this kind of idea is really quite simple. Farmville is free. You play it a lot. You want to have a better tractor or a machine gun, you know, to kill your neighbor farmers. So you buy it. Right? This is a very interesting business model we're going to see. For example, can you imagine in music, you're buying a virtual item, right? You're buying, for example, a greeting by John Mayer on your website that place when people come to your website. Right? Those kind of things are going to be sold by a lot of people. Uh, here's an interesting German guy. He actually uh, works for Google and he came up with this idea of Google Goggles. Anybody know Google Goggles? Okay, if you have an Android phone, you should try it. Hi, right? I'm this will boggle I'm your mind. At Hi, I'm Shailesh, product manager at Google. We're here to introduce Google Goggles, a visual search application for Android phones. Until now, the only option for web search has been typing or speaking. Now you can search by taking a photo. Let's try this book. Just open Google Goggles, fill as much of the screen as possible with the object, and take a picture. You'll see the exact book match in the search results without typing or saying a word. Another good use is on a business card. Let's try mine. Frame the text you're interested in well, Google Goggles will recognize the text and return a result. Now I can click to call Shailesh or add him to my contacts. Let's go out and check what else Google Goggles can do. We can figure out the title and artist of this painting. This is scary stuff, right? I mean, basically, this is going to be in every single mobile phone around the world. I can hold up. I mean, it's currently blocked with people. Right? Google is blocking people from recognizing people. Right? But I can hold up to anything, identify stuff, right? Imagine what this will do for marketing. Right? What you can do there to place your ad word into this, right? I mean, this kind of potential is limitless. So basically what's happening around the world, I think we're moving from this idea. Any telecom companies here? I'm sure the OIC people are here, right? This is the old telecom model, right? The walled garden. It's a beautiful place. As long as you're inside. It's basically as long as you are part of the environment, telecoms, Apple, Nintendo, and so on, it's beautiful. Right? This is old. This is not going to work any longer. Right? The walled garden, no matter how nice the flowers, will not work. This is the new walled garden. Right? It's something that only works if you collaborate. This is a, a game in Africa called the Anansi. Uh, it's something uh, that you play together. Uh, I've got it from a woman who actually went there and photographed this. So this shows that basically what business looks like in the future is the collaborative effort to build something together. Right? Only that is the direction forward. Time Warner. Right? This is old. Right? This idea of having a media company, of course, they will continue, I hope. I don't, I don't know. 
but they will continue. But the future is this, right? The future is the Twitter News Network, TNN, not CNN. I got this from Brian Soul, who's really a smart guy. So what's happening now, rather than having huge buildings to make news, we get the news from people. It's the Twitter News Network. It's decentralized. They make the news. This idea of brands, media companies, you know, we are the big broadcaster, right? We're the network, right? May continue to some degree, but it's very expensive to do. The idea of marketing, for example, by a watering can, you know, getting everyone to see you, very expensive, and that idea is shrinking. The future idea is this. Connect people to each other, and they carry your message if they like you. You have to get them to like you. That's the message. Right? You have to get your users to like you to tell others. Right? That's how all successful campaigns are based on the idea of a networked business. And you may say, well, in Brazil, that's all great. People are not on the internet yet. Right? And that's probably true. I think the total penetration in Brazil is something around 5% right? on, on broadband. So that's about 30%, I think, in total. So the number isn't huge, right? But when will this change? You have to be the judge of that. I think it's going to change very quickly. And I'll show you why, in a moment, why network business is going to win. One thing is that network people innovate faster. I mean, the reason I'm here is a very example of this. Right? We got networked, we started thinking, we started doing something. Right? When you see in companies that people are networked, right, every single person that is networked with others, they produce results faster, quicker, more reliable, and they're sourced from everyone. Right? What you used to have is the idea of not, not started here, like companies would say, this is a great idea, but we didn't have it. Right? That's replaced by proudly found elsewhere, PFE. Right? Most of my work is proudly found elsewhere. I collect, I collate, I don't make it up, I find it elsewhere, and vice versa. So that's how innovation works. Now in communications, we're moving to what I call communication 2.0, not very unique, but maybe you have a better name is a decentralized way of communicating. Look at the wheel. Right? We communicate now in multiple layers. We don't communicate because something is coming from the top, we just go out and buy it. Right? We research. 98% of people who buy cars, they do a lot of research and they ask their friends. The most popular word of mouth is word of mouth with people, followed by word of mouth on social networks, by people like me. Right, it's mobile, of course, that's clear. It's cross-media, it's telling stories across the platform. And I have another slide of that later. It's interactive and it's real time. So if you're thinking about a campaign or a marketing idea, it should fulfill those notions, right? Decentralized, viral, mobile, interactive, real time. So I want to talk briefly about social media because that's the topic, right? After all, it's supposed to be the topic. This, of course, is a not a good idea. It's not a good expression, right? Social media is sort of like, uh, you know, you could, you could argue that if you have a fax machine, then you're in the fax machine business. You know, it's not about this. It's a much, it's sort of a mis misnomer. I think it's much better to use the name networked media, real-time media, user-driven media, engaged media. And that's true for business, too. So everybody on Twitter, have you noticed, is a social media expert that you can hire. Right? Calculations have shown that next year every single person on Twitter will be an expert that you can hire for social media. Right? So let's not confuse things. Right? When we think about social media, it goes a lot deeper than saying when you're on a tweet or Facebook. Right? Let's turn this upside down. The future of communications are these keywords. First keyword is you communicate, you buy, you transact when you're out and about. <coughs> That, that is what's happening everywhere, especially with kids, right? When you're out and about, that's the keyword. Within your tribe, you want to read a great book, you should read Seth Godin, called, uh, a book called Tribes. I think it's called Tribes. Um, basically, the idea is we all have about 150 people that are around us as a tribe. Right? 
What they say is the most crucial to us, apart from meeting people in person, that's the tribe. And then some of us have a larger tribe, right? But that's basically what happens. Everything that happens within the tribe is the most, most meaningful. Right? So that is the way our communication happens. And it's strangers and people like me. What attracts us to people, to read people's blogs or Twitter or Facebook, is they, they sort of look like what I look like, right? They have the same interest. So the last year I've connected with 150 really brilliant people from all over the world and I blatantly take their stuff for me and I sell it to you, not just kidding. But they do the same. This is basically what's happening is we're starting to feel better about strangers that are like me than about the CEO of Nokia. We have more trust in strangers on the internet than we trust the CEO of a phone company. So what is the solution if you're in marketing? You have to use this to your advantage. You have to get influence right, in this network. At the right time, with complete transparency, under the control of the user, and because they trust you or don't trust you. The last part is the most important part, right? Trust is the currency. Trust is the only thing that you can't lie about. And on the internet, it's completely obvious. If you've lied, everybody will talk about it. HSBC, the bank in England, they announced three, uh, two years ago a deal for all students to start free credit cards, free checking, free everything for the entire duration of the studies in England. Three months after 100,000 people signed up, HSBC said, well, we're, you know, we need to make some money here, so we're changing this, and it's 100 pounds now for the same deal. They just changed it. So in 16 hours, over 100,000 people on Facebook built a group against HSBC, and they ended up on television and all the top line news, and HSBC stock went like this, right? because they lied, basically. So a day later, they announced that we're going to extend the free offer for five years to every person that had already signed up. Right? That's what happens of trust on the internet. So, um, this is Google social search, right? They just switched on this buzz thing that you may know about, which got a lot of controversy, right? But what's happening in search, all of a sudden, it's more important, this is my people, my connections on Google. It takes a long time to scroll. But um, it's a lot more important to find out what people around you are searching or offering than the strangers, right? So social search is a big thing in the future. This is a Twitter feed, for example, that mentions what I do. So when people search, they look at this now. They don't look at Google. They look at the Twitter feed about what people are saying in real time. So this is what people are now doing for brands. Right? If they want to buy a car, they go to search.twitter.com and they look at the car and the feedback that people are doing right here and there, right? Social search from people on your network. So there's a great institute in Holland called Vint. And they have a slide saying, we're moving from the mechanical age of speed into the digital age of real time. Right? Marshall McLuhan, the founder, the futurist founder, the guru himself, he says that media and communication is an extension of man, is an extension of what I do is the medium. Right? So what we have now with companies like Foursquare, Google Latitude, and Twitter, they're becoming extensions of us. They're becoming an extension, a real life extension. That's why they're, they're so powerful. But let me warn you, right? It all sounds great, but the internet is not a rose garden. What's happening on the internet is that we are gaining the power as the user, but we have not learned the responsibility. We have not learned how to keep things in the right way, right? We're completely blown away by the power that we have. We're on a power trip as the user. We need to figure out ways that we can balance this and find a way to actually administer it. It's very important, of course, in education and with kids. So Marshall McLuhan, again, giving us a, a brief quote. The uh, global village is a world in which you don't necessarily have harmony. You have extreme concern with everybody else's business and much involvement in everybody else's life. It's a sort of Ann Landers column writ large. And uh, it... Uh, doesn't necessarily mean harmony and peace and quiet, but it does mean huge involvement in everybody else's affairs. 
And so the global village is as big as the planet and as small as uh, the village post office. Very interesting, 50 years ago, right? 50 years ago. Right? When we are connected, it does not mean harmony. Right? Because it means chaos. Yeah? We're connecting to each other, creating a huge amount of noise. Right? But think about what happens when you go to a, a show, an opera, or a classical orchestra. Right? When you, when you come in, people are tuning up, it is a hell of a noise. Right? Everybody's tuning up, trying to get the instrument ready. Right? It sounds just like noise. But when the conductor shows up, right, it's a beautiful piece of music. What we have on the internet right now is a lot of noise. Right? Part of the job is to conduct into a song. Right? This is what the brands are looking for with agencies now. They're looking for you to filter the noise, right, to curate, come up with ideas, and filter it down to something that you can actually use, right, to find out how this works. And as Marshall McLuhan again said, it's the framework that changes, not the picture. Again, going back to social media, if you think that you can have a Twitter account and that is social media, right? You've looked at the picture, but not the framework, right? The framework is connected consumers are different. You have to use them, empower them in a way that we can still, and this is the key question, right? Do we still need advertising when we're all connected? Did we actually only have advertising because there was no internet? It's a legitimate question. I think it's a question of saying, well, if my friends and my tribe is telling me about the good stuff, why do I need advertising? What we're going to see in the future is advertising becoming content. Advertising becoming its own meaning. This is my uh, a summary of a mail I got from SlideShare saying what I do. And, uh, uh, in terms of sharing my slideshow, so some, some numbers there, but basically SlideShare, many of you know SlideShare, I'm sure, and it's G. Leonhard and SlideShare. Last year I got 15 speaking gigs from SlideShare, right, because I share my content rather than advertising for it, right? The content itself is the marketing. The brand is the content, right? You as a brand are a publisher. Every brand has become a publisher publishing the message about what you do. Right. Using services like this. Right. I'm going to skip this video because I don't want to be here forever. So you may be saying, OK, this is all great, but in Brazil, you know, we're, we're not connected enough for this. Right. People are not actually using the mobile internet. Of course, it's expensive, right? So this is what's happening now with a company called O3B, the other three billion. It's a company where, no surprise, Google has invested over $500 million in this company. And Google invests everywhere. Not in me, unfortunately. But in any case, this company is putting up 18 satellites around the world to provide internet access to Brazil, India, China, Indonesia, Africa for free, or almost free. Google is starting to compete with the telecoms for internet access because the telecoms are so slow to make it happen. That's what Google is saying. Right? Because now that everything is real time, the networks are really busy, right? Everybody's streaming and downloading, and you know, it's, it's, it's a huge drain on the network, right? So Google is saying, we want people to connect at one gigabit per second. That's a motion picture at less than two seconds download like Korea. Okay. They're putting out these satellites. The first one is going online September 10th, 2010. For you, right here in Brazil. That's ideal right there. So if you're looking at this, Wikipedia says O3B will completely change the economics of the telecoms business. So if in the telecoms business, you have reason to invent quickly and to move forward and to reduce the prices, right? Because competition is coming, especially in countries like Brazil and so on. And even in the US, Google is rolling out high-speed internet at one gigabit per second in certain cities on their own. So talking about interruption, there's a great book called What Would Google Do? So if you're in the marketing business, you should, it's by name, by a guy, uh, Jeff Jarvis, who, uh, who wrote it. Uh, you should read this. Google isn't going to wait for the telecoms to create the rising tide. 
and neither should you. Right? If you wait for somebody else to make the rising tide, you risk a jumping on in the last minute. Right? It's basically social search. This is my social search example. Is the tablet, is the Nexus phone, and it's Google Buzz What's on the mobile. What's unique about posting Buzz from your phone is you can tag your location. You can just use the suggested tag if it's correct, or refine your location. Now your buzz is showing up that this location had. Now many of you may say, and I keep hearing this of course all the time, this is really geeky stuff. You know, it's for technology freaks or gadget freaks, right? Well, very soon in the next couple of years, we're going to see my grandmother buy stuff on her mobile phone. Because it will be as easy as a remote control for television. Devices will be so cheap and subsidized Right, and plugged with all kinds of values that have become irresistible, just like television. Right. And they will completely merge with television. So this is basically the direction that we're heading in. Um, some stats on Brazil, you probably already know this, but broadband penetration has increased 5.8% last year. Uh, the growth was 36.5% last year. And there's an increase in broadband penetration also on the mobile. Right? So basically, Brazil is approaching what I call broadband culture. The title of my next book, free book. So broadband culture. Right? A lot of people in Europe are saying, well, that's really like broadband unculture. Right? Because it's like just noise, garbage. Right? I mean, people are arguing Twitter is just blah, blah, meaningless babble. Right? I would argue that it's just as meaningless as television was. And is, right, if you're tuned to the wrong channel. Broadband culture is what's going to change a lot of these things if we're looking in this direction. Broadband culture here in Brazil, number two worldwide on Twitter is Brazil. You probably already knew this. Because I guess you like to talk, or maybe SMS are expensive, you know, maybe both. Right. So Twitter and Facebook and social services are bound to take away a lot of the SMS revenues from the operators around the world. If you have a flat rate data plan, why do you SMS? Right? If you don't want to send to your, just to your friends, you can just send a message on Twitter, right? It's free. Right? That is going to change the equation. All telecoms will move into social media in the future. Right? This kind of idea, what's happening on the web, right? it's swelling. right? We have seen nothing yet. 65 million images per day on Flickr, it will be 6 billion when we all have these boxes. Flickr will explode. So this is the business in the future, is to take the noise and to curate it. This is the future of journalism, it's the future of radio, television, the future of brands, right? The, our role is not to make more noise. I mean, of course our role is also to make noise. The other part is to make sense of it, to read it. The sense of the New York Times is not to have fantastic writers write about everything and pay them a quarter million to write. That's one of the ideas of the New York Times. The other one is to take the noise and filter it. Because filtering is a very, very difficult job. Because you have to understand the subject matter. That's what advertising agencies, planning agencies, marketers do for brands. They filter the noise and they turn it into an output and an input. That's a big business, right? Back to this question that I was asking earlier. This is probably the answer, you know, in marketing, we're essentially now in this business, right? We're essentially in the business of curating attention. That's the job. People have limited time, limited money, of course, but first of all, they have limited attention. So the job is to get the attention and focus it. Right? That is the job of marketing and distribution or advertising in the future. Right? We're essentially all in the audience business. We're all musicians right? or actors. I mean, we're essentially in the business of connecting the audience with a brand or a product or something. We're in the audience business. Right? And on the internet, that mission is extremely interesting and very powerful. So this idea of doing business, you know, the domination scheme, right? you lose, I win, that worked for a long time and it was great, right? If you were on top. 
Right? Now John Hegel is saying the job of leadership is not to make more money and not just to make more money, it is to make meaning. And your job isn't to just say maximize the profit, but to make meaning in the ecosystem of your company, to create value for everyone. That's a quite a different story. That means your company has to change and leaders become connectors. If you want to be a leader, you're not just a director. That's Steve Jobs, right? <laughs> he is a fantastic leader, a brilliant guy. He's not a connector. Or maybe he is in some ways, but he's not a good example for a connector, right? If you want to be a director, you make a movie, but even movies are now made by people who are connectors in teams, virtual movies, right? Online collaboration. If you're in the advertising, marketing business, or branding, this is your job, is to connect your brand. Not to direct the consumer, right? but to just make the connection. So in broadband culture, that's sort of which way we're heading with this, right? We're heading into what was hyper-competition, now it's hyper-collaboration. And you may be thinking that you must be mad to propose that we can make more money if we don't compete but we collaborate. But I tell you, look at all these successful examples in the last five years. Airlines that are successful, right? Amazon, Skype, all these successful examples, they know how to collaborate to create business together. And I think that could very well be the paradigm of Brazil. Right? When you look at the copyright reform, the idea of how you make money together that is the key to the future, is to make money together. The key to the past was to make as much money as I can, and if you guys die over here, it's okay. Right? Because I'm still having my shareholder profit. So the idea of the future is hyper-collaboration, right? And for a lot of people, I'm amazed at this, right? A lot of people are saying to me, you're talking about communism here, right? This isn't communism, this is capitalism as much as you can, I mean, this is Darwinism, right? Because the future is not the survival of the fittest, but the survival of the ones that collaborate to be fit together. Right? That is extremely difficult. So it's not like you're going to get something for free. Right? This is actually harder. It's much easier to compete and to blow people away than to collaborate to create something together. Right? So we're seeing this around the world in different parallels. Here's a great example. Uh, uh, a company called O'Reilly Box. O'Reilly's based in uh, California. And what they did is they said, okay, we're writing all these geek books, you know, HTML, code, and, you know, stuff I don't read. So they said, what are we going to do about the internet? People are copying our books and publishing, you know, how to make web pages and so on, right? So what they said is, let's get together with our biggest competitor in geek books, programming books, right? and form a service called Safari Books. Safari Books offers 15,000 books on the internet, on the mobile, on the reading devices, pretty much anywhere for $42 a month. You can use all the books. Download, print, PDF, share, cut and paste, whatever you want. This is the most successful model that they have ever launched, right? It's a collaborative model on a flat rate basis. Think about your business and telephony. Uh, on, on mobile phones, flat rates are, of course, right? That, that is the key, right? So Nextel has a flat rate, right? That's why you talk for free, basically. You think it's free, but it's just a flat rate, right? I call it feels like free. If you can find a way to make your service feel like free, so you don't get punished for using it, right? that's the bundle that we have, for example, in Safari Book. People who are, work, who are working for companies, programming things, they're all Safari Book subscribers. To them, it's free. They don't think of the $42 as a payment. That's already the history. It's already gone. It just keeps going. It's like cable TV. Right? Do you remember cable TV when it first started? Everybody said, this is crazy. Nobody will pay for cable TV when it's free over the air. A right? little bit better picture, but... Cable TV in a very short time became, in America, for example, you start with $10. The average American is paying $82 a month for cable TV, voluntarily. That is the model for media in the future. Start with something that feels like free, 
and upsell to the $80. It's not rocket science, but we have to get off this idea of saying we're going to control what people do because it doesn't work. So broadband culture is going to be a hell of a lot of work for us because it's disrupting, right? It's a radical disruption of production, copyright, ownership, authority, and control. Disruption doesn't mean it's going to go away, obviously. This is not a black or white issue, right? But we have to get used, for example, if you're in a doctor's room today, you know you've got fungus or whatever you've got, right? You can go on the mobile internet, half of the people at the doctor's office in Switzerland are Googling their disease while they're waiting for the doctor, right? And they go to Wikipedia or Wiki, whatever it's called on the iPhone, right? They go to the doctor and say, you know, I've, I've, I found this medication in China last week, somebody published it, can you get it? And the doctor says, what? Never heard of it, right? So your authority is challenged. Your authority as the person that knows everything, controls everything, is challenged, right? So what you, what you have to do if you're in the position of authority, right? You have to bring this in. Because if you don't bring this in, you lose the trust, right? Next time I come back to the doctor, and I ask him again about the medicine, he does, still doesn't know I'm not going back. And that's what's happening across the board, right? We have to get used to this broadband culture shift, the shift of authority, right? We don't want to end up like the music business, right? Saying, please don't kill me, but we're already fried. So the Wii is a great example. Anybody here play the Wii? Okay. I love the Wii, right? Because what the Wii has proven is a very simple thing, foresight. The people who invented the Wii said, people are going to get off the couch, move around the room. What a crazy idea for a game, right? You're on the couch, eating chips, watching the screen. Right? Everybody said, this is a crazy idea. Nobody will buy this, right? Because games are not about moving, right? They're the opposite of moving, right? The Wii has been the most successful game for the last five years. Right? It's just sort of winding down. And part of the thing that happens, you have unintended circum uh, uh, consequences of, of behavior changes at this. When people change behaviors, you have damage. Right? How can we expect people to use the power of the internet and not create damage? Uh, damage is privacy violation, is uh, identity theft, is crime, cybercrime. That's all the unintended consequences of the power. Right? The answer is not to say, well, we'll never invent this again, or we've, we make it illegal. The answer is to tell people how they can put the strap over the Wii and not have it go in there. Right? I mean, why would you make the Wii illegal, right, if you can just put it onto your wrist? Right? That is what media companies want to do. Right? They don't want us to play the Wii, which is you know, the power that we have. Right? We need to go to an approach that says, okay, let's prevent the holds and find a sensible way of orchestrating this. And I hope you get to do this in Brazil. What we're seeing across the web, and I think you're feeling this very much, how much more time do we have? No more time, okay. <laughs> okay, I'll wrap this up quickly. Just as a quick, um, as a quick way out here, Texas Instruments is the most uh, successful device that they have, right? They have decided that, that Texas Instruments, now they're moving from selling stuff to selling services. They have an iPhone app. Right? Texas Instruments put this device into an iPhone app that you can buy virtually, right? So they're no longer in the stuff business. They're still in the stuff business, but it's pretty much happening everywhere from a packaged goods and stuff idea to a service and experience. That's happening everywhere with cars, with devices, with all kinds of things like Mini Cooper now has a, a ride center where you can share rides in Germany. They sell the right center, but they make cars. Right? And of course, Nokia now has a music service. What does it have to do with the mobile? Well, they want to sell experiences, right? Kodak is selling stuff and this. Salesforce.com, the most successful company in the cloud, right? They don't sell any stuff. It's a service, right? It's an access, it's an experience. Zappos, BMW, and many others. So that's quite clear that we're heading in this direction. We're going to take questions very soon. I'm going to 
actually go to the web app stage here. Uh, okay. Just real quick about experience, right? If you're in the branding, marketing, advertising business, you know the most important thing is to sell experience, is to make people feel special about what you're telling them. Right? That is the most expensive part. Will people listen to music on the internet and not go to the Montreux Jazz Festival or not go to Glastonbury? No, they want to go more than ever. Right? People have cyber sex doesn't mean they want a girlfriend. Right? There is the experience factor, right? This is what you want. You want experience Nike Plus, the running shoe. The biggest invention in the shoe market had nothing to do with shoes. Connect the running to the internet. You want to reinvent your brand? Think of how you can add experience. Some experience factor that may have nothing to do with what you have in terms of the actual product, right? Jeep has a huge Facebook following people sharing their experiences and of course again Apple, right? So in an experience world, where we all are hungry for real experiences, the way that we tell stories is changing. And this is the most crucial mission, I think, if you're looking at this, right? You have to tell stories. JetBlue allows people to tell their stories, right? And you have to listen to people, actually. The media story is unfolding like this, right? All of a sudden, storytelling has changed. There's links, there's feeds, there's interaction, right? Other people are telling the stories, right? The Ford side, right? and this is an age-old book from the 90s, right? Where I think Don Tap Tapscott wrote the book, right? Markets are conversations. Yeah. Well, this is like Stone Age internet, right? It's finally becoming true, right? So the idea of telling stories, connecting a tribe, leading a movement, making change, that, that's where the story ends up, right? So what happens with a lot of brands is now we're moving into this environment, right? A transmedia, cross-media storytelling. Where we have a story and we tell it in videos, we tell it on the mobile, we tell it on television, any which way in the gaming platform, any which way. Right? On all these platforms that people are actually using. A lot of people are saying, well, you talk a lot about stuff, let's talk about action. That's the action. When you're thinking about a business, don't think like this. Don't think about a walled garden. Don't think about controlling something that you are inside and your customers are inside and that makes a happy couple. Right? That is possible, but it's highly unlikely. Right? So do think like this. Think of an open environment, a scenario where you can allow people to contribute. Right? Determine what you want to broadcast. What's your message? Right? If you're Globo or Bob's or Oi, what's your message? Right? What attracts people to your brand? Old advertising is make-believe. Right? Coca-Cola as a baby makes you a better baby. Right? 50 years ago. Now the new advertising is understanding. Right? I'll give an example of understanding. Hyundai, the car company, two years ago offered a deal where you could give back the car if you got unemployed. Uh, in America, their, their sales increased by 14%. This is the trailer. For this one. A decade ago, Hyundai pioneered America's best warranty to show you the faith we have in our cars. Today, we're introducing Hyundai Assurance to show you the faith we have in you. Right now, buy any new Hyundai, and if in the next year you lose your income, we'll let you return it. A simple promise, right? How many people actually return the car? Very few. Right? Think of this as a way of saying, well, how do you build trust with your audience? Right? How do you move forward in this? Now, I will actually wrap up now. I promised I would. So to wrap this up, as I was saying earlier, this is the recipe for success. Open platforms, open business, open transparency, open for conversation. Yes, you can succeed being closed, but don't try it. Right? Open is the way forward. And I think as uh, Tim Riley, O'Reilly from, uh, from O'Reilly Publishing says, create more value than you capture. That's the paradox of business and communications for the future. When you create more value, you are more value. Right? That is the direction that I'm going with this. So anyway, thanks for your attention. We're going to take some questions now, I guess. right? And you can download the PDF at Media Futures. Thank you.
Bom, gente, a ideia é a seguinte, as perguntas podem ser feitas em português, alguém vai traduzir e você vai levar né, o, o microfone para quem quiser perguntar. Como é que você vê a tentativa de controle da, da internet, das conexões na China? You could say China has, uh, is basically stuck in the old world of capitalism um, that they're trying to exploit. I think basically what's happening in China is, and this is why I really like Google's decision to possibly leave China, um, I think this is the last period that we're thinking that people can control and prosper. You know, I think the Chinese government will realize very soon, just like Iran, for example, you can't control and prosper. You can only keep the lid on until the connectivity is much higher, right? So what's happening in Iran right now is, for example, 30% of people are under the age of 20. They're all on Facebook. They're mobilizing, right? There's no way you can put the lid on this like you did 10 years ago. And the same thing is going to happen in China. And I think Google's decision to pull out of China is a great proof that we can maybe still trust them, right? Because they are posing this kind of idea. I think basically the it's quite clear for all governments, if they want to prosper and to grow, they have to allow people to connect and talk. Right? And that's pretty much, China or not, that's the future. I'm just a little bit curious on how you see the whole aspect of you know, multitasking and fragmented uh, media consumption. Because when you were mentioning uh, the future of communications keywords, uh, nothing really referred to that. And I think uh, we are moving towards a path where you're not going to do just one thing. You're not going to be you know, just using uh, Twitter or uh, you'll be doing several things at the same time. So. Well, I, you know, I have to say I'm rather pessimistic on multitasking. Uh, I'm, I'm too old for that. I think what's happening is because the possibility of doing all these things are constantly exploding. We have to learn how to juggle, right? And have you ever tried to juggle? You know, if you've tried to juggle, anybody can do one ball, right, hopefully, right? You can do two balls, okay? That's not so hard. You can do three, you can learn how to do three balls, not very, not, doesn't take much longer than half an hour, maybe. But four, five, six balls, right, very hard. So it all depends how much you can juggle, right? And I think what we're seeing right now is that basically it's a question of age, it's a question of, uh, mindscape, right? But the juggling is difficult, right? So as I was saying earlier, the responsibility that comes with the tools, we haven't learned yet. Right? The internet is like nuclear power, right? We can make a bomb or we can you know, heat the house, right? So right now we haven't really figured out how to keep one from the other. You know, on the internet, we're just toying around, right? So we're still in the noise making stage. Right? The next few years, I think especially when we're really used to it, we'll get used to filter the noise and find the, re the real stuff. Right? We're still very much at the beginning. But depending how young you are now, like in 10 years, all those kids that are there, they, they are growing up doing 10 things at the same time. So it'd be perfectly natural for them. Yeah, I, I think it will actually be both. You know, I think the most successful stories are stories that take all of your attention. Uh, they're immersive experiences. They're not experiences where you can also watch television, write an email, send an SMS, you know? I mean, if you want to be successful in media, I think you have to have a really immersive, attractive story that just takes you over, right? uh, And that could be a two-minute story or a two-second story, right? But that, that's what I'm looking for. I'm looking for an immersive story. I'm not looking for being part of the noise, you know? Uh, I'm looking to get through the noise. First of all, congratulations. Excellent presentation. Thank you. Uh, my interest is mainly on how we may charge for content in the future. Uh, you've done a good job of, of, of showing how traditional models have to change, will change. Uh, I, I saw in your presentation at Picnic last year, which I saw just the video, you suggested then some kind of system of metering or monitoring content. You made an analogy to sort of a water meter. Yes. That would meter what people do on the internet and would, would charge them in little drips that it would feel like it's free. I thought that was a very, very silly suggestion, quite honestly, because it goes against the whole, the whole ethos of the internet, which is, I mean, I mean it's, it was almost like a, a big brother concept. And it reminded me of George Bush's Patriot Act when he was gonna start monitoring the books that people would take out of libraries. And I notice you, you don't have that metering suggestion in this presentation. Have you backed away from it? 
<laughs> I think that was a misunderstanding. You know, uh, that's the first I was ever put together with George Bush in one sentence. But um, <laughs> basically, the most successful models around the world are based on flat rate access. Right? Your water. It's not flat rated, but everybody has access very easily, right? You don't have to beg to get the water to work. You have to pay, but it's sort of flat rate. It's easy to get, right? Electricity, when you plug in here, you don't ask for a credit card. You just use the power here, somebody else pays, right? Mobile phones, cable TV, radio, right? They're essentially models where we all use and we all make a payment, but it's not granular. It's not happening at the same time. So for music, for example, the only model that makes sense for music is to be bundled into access, flat rated. Okay. It's exactly like radio. A hundred years ago when radio was invented, all of the artists, composers, and publishers said, we hate radio. It's free music. Right? Free music is terrible for us because if people have free music that won't buy the sheet music, they won't buy the piano roll, they won't go to the concert. Right? They tried to kill radio. Radio became so popular that it could not be denied. Most governments around the world said, you have to give permission to radio. And radio has to pay. Right? So basically what we have now is radio became the biggest driver of music ever. Right? So what we're seeing on the internet is the same thing. It makes a lot of things free, and we may not like it. But there is money on the other end of that free. Right? What we have to do is figure out how we can make it legal and turn it into money. And I think with the answer to your question, finally, uh, the metering part comes in here, really quite simple. If music is included in my mobile subscription, and I mean included, not charged, included, or my DSL subscription, my wireless, right? then essentially all that needs to happen is to somehow get an idea of how many songs or which songs I listen to, which can be very easily done, so that the creators can get paid proportionally. For example, what happens now when you're on YouTube? YouTube knows which videos you've played. We may not like the idea very much, but that data can be used to pay the owners that created the video and the music. But right now there's no license in place. So what I was trying to say at Picnic last year is really quite simple, is the flat rate access is the way forward to monetize it. It's not about controlling what people listen to or monitoring it in the sense of data, right? but just distributing it. So the, there's all kinds of ways it would lead to, uh, to too many details to get into all that stuff now. But basically the flat rate scenario for music is the only solution and probably also for books, but primarily for music. And you're going to see it already at some countries like China. Google has a flat rate for music. And Denmark and Canada, you probably see it here fairly soon. That means that anybody with internet access has access to music. Uh, is, there, is, is there any real way to charge for that kind of content that isn't metering? I mean, your, 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 your metering proposal is technically perfect. Okay. But it seems to go, go against the whole idea okay. of, of, of free Oh, not, not so much yeah, I got your question now. I'm okay. going to answer it right away. Okay. So basically, what, it's really quite simple. When you're a content creator, there's three ways to get paid. Okay? One way is I pay, so I create and I pay, like a blogger. right? Bloggers create and they pay, right? because they have to have the web website. right? So I pay or you pay. And the third model is they pay. Somebody else pays. That's the three ways. I pay, you pay, they pay. So any model in the future has to be a combination of these models. In other words, if I'm a journalist, I have to figure out a way that maybe some of they pay, some of the user pays. Right? In other words, it's a combination of different streams. The New York Times is already doing a very good job at this. So you have a dozen different revenue streams. Right? You have subscriptions. You have advertising, which is a powerful model. Always will be. Right? You have direct payments. You have voluntary payments, patronage. Right? You have systems like, uh, it's called Flatter. You guys may know about Flatter. Right? It's a way of giving credits to authors right? by using a system of micropayments. Right? And you have ways of saying it's completely free, but you can make a payment somewhere else. For example, what I'm doing for my iPhone app, I've, uh, I think several thousand people have downloaded it already. I will not charge for the app. I will allow you to go to a link and say, you can buy my PDF, even though 
my PDF is also free. But there's a payment link, right? You can make a payment in the process of looking what I do. Last year I made over $5,000 selling free books by people who can just get my books and give me money anyway, right? The radio had model in a way, you could argue, right? However, I have to warn, of course, there is not a uniform path to monetizing. Everybody is in a different position. Right? If Murdoch wants the Wall Street Journal to take money, maybe he can get it. I'd be happy for him. I doubt that's a model across the board. I think what is going to win in the future is a model that works for each, uh, in each place, with each user group, with each kind of content. And therein lies the difficulty. Right? So I think the answer is we'll have a mixed model, some free, some paid, some paid with micropayments, some bundled. I see telecoms moving into the market and saying we're going to facilitate the payment for the content by selling ads against it. For example, uh, I know music best, so I'm going to use the music example again, but in Europe it's quite clear that if people paid one euro a week for music, you could make music free. One euro a week, right? And now it's quite clear that if I'm willing to pay a euro a week, I don't have to because somebody else will pay it for me, to reach me. Right? Advertisers will gladly pay the euro to reach me. So in fact, it's free. Music is free for me. I, somebody else pays for the, for the profit. Right? So basically looking at euro, for example, 800 million people paying a euro a week for music makes the music industry twice as big in one, in one blow. And I don't even pay. So it's possible to solve this problem, right? But what needs to happen, I think this is crucial for the creators, is to give permission for those new models. Right? Is to look at how we can actually make it happen rather than saying, but I really want $10, which is reasonable, right? of course. And in journalism, I think we're, we have a great position in journalism because journalism is not all about me writing, it's also about curating. Right? It's about looking at other stuff and formulating it. Right? New York Times isn't just a great paper because of the writers, because they formulate, right? they curate the package. Right? The same is true for broadcasters. So I think those models will be unfolding. In fact, I'll be speaking at a conference in April uh, for the New York Times about this topic. Okay, so another question. What do you think will be the tablets, the, the, the devices that we will use more well, I mean, yeah, I mean, I think all of us like to look for one-track answers, you know. Uh, there's no such thing here. I, I think basically you have all kinds of different kinds of users, different cultures, different behaviors. They will all use different ways to get the media, right? So you will see uh, basically cross-platform media. So when you're traveling, you use your mobile phone to watch the news. When you're at home, in your bed, you use the tablet. When you're in the living room, you use the, the PlayStation whatever it is, the, the platform will change. But this is where cloud computing comes in, right? All of our media will be in the cloud. All of our contacts, our media, our playlist, they will not sit on my wristwatch or my mobile phone, right? All the information will be up there and I can get to it wherever device I am on, it will be automatically formatted for the device, right? So what we're seeing with cloud computing is that becomes the key to how we can monetize the content, right? So, I think ultimately it doesn't matter what device you're on, you'll always have the right mix of your content for that device because it comes from the cloud. Alguém mais quer fazer uma pergunta? Então, Gerd, muito obrigado. Muito obrigado. Prazer tê-lo aqui. Thank e you. a vocês todos. Tá? Thank you. Muito obrigado. Thank you.